Would you help me by welcoming him back to the board this morning, Pastor Dan? Thank you. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And Merry Christmas. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. This is one place I know we can say that. <coughs> Actually, we can say it anywhere. That's for sure. Uh, thank you for those kind words. It's been a joy working with your worship team. Uh, not every church is blessed with the kind of leadership that your worship team has. Amen. Uh, you can go to churches that uh, maybe have bigger teams or more this or more that. Uh, but what they do is they're performing and you're their audience. Uh, with this worship team, I sense, is they're performing. But he is the audience, and we're invited to join in Amen. with him. Amen. That is such a huge paradigm shift, but it's essential. And so I encourage you to continue to allow worship to not be up here, but from here. Yes. And Amen. for those of you like me that love to sing, even though people don't want to stand next to me when I do it, <laughs> continue to make a joyful noise. I appreciate the deacons uh, making my time with you a uh, uh, joy for me. So thank you. And church, thank you. Some of you got some conversations in. I'm grateful for that. As I came to this, uh, this preparing for this Sunday, I was thinking, uh, you know, what can I, I just had a desire, I hope this doesn't sound haughty in my sense, but I just had this desire to be able to, to talk about something that that would be a deposit for you in your own life, but also in the church's life as you face however long God will have it, this transition time, setting you up for a, a new chapter, a wonderful chapter. Uh, thinking, what what is that me? Did I you lose me or no? You okay? Be sitting here? Oh there we go. Uh, <laughs> What could I talk about that would, uh, I mean, anything you talk about in the Bible is good, but what can I talk about that might be something you can carry with you uh, into the weeks and months and I would pray years ahead. And so I was seeking the Lord on that, of course, and uh, he, instead of having me look, in a sense, to a, a, a forward, he had me look backwards first. And it really came from the, the scripture that came from our first Advent candle ceremony. Looking at Luke chapter 1, verse 34. And in that section it says this, How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? How am I going to have a baby? That, that doesn't make sense. Well, the angel answered her and said, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, for no word from God will ever fail. I go, well, Lord, uh, does that mean you, you want us to look more at Mary? Or you want us to look more at this fearless obedience that she had? It was as if the Lord was saying, no, that's not the topic, but, but press in a little bit. I began to think, well, what's amazing about this, this section? Well, everything is, but, you know, anytime an angel shows up, that's kind of amazing. amazing. Uh, but remember, <coughs> angels are messengers of the Lord. Uh, yes. They come to bring a message that he is wanting to speak, in this case to Mary, and through her to the world. Uh, be, be careful with what you see in, in our culture with angels. and uh, A lot of it is just sentimentality, and it's, it's not it's not biblical. And, uh, in fact, it's even some will talk about uh, how, you know, if someone's passed away, well, we now have an angel in heaven. Well, that's not true. We will never become angels and should never desire to be that. Angels are created for a certain purpose, uh, and one of their purposes is to serve us, which doesn't you know, make, make us great. It makes us godly. And, and, uh, anyway, this is the sermon on angels, but that was my point. I saw the angel in there, and the Lord said, well, it's important, but that's not what, what I really want to focus on. Mary, wonderful. Uh, I think a lot of times in our so-called Protestant church, uh, in trying not to commit some of the errors of, of what we might see in the Roman Catholic Church, of people who pray to Mary or venerate her too highly, we ignore her. And uh, you know, Mary uh, was highly favored of the Lord, and there's much to learn from her. Just as we study a David, a Moses, a Paul, a Peter, um, Mary is worthy of our, our gratitude. But it wasn't Mary either. And I was saying, what else is in here? 
And then it occurred to me, oh, there it is in 35, the Holy Spirit. And I realized that I had done what I oftentimes preach about uh, in the negative. And that is that I marginalized the Holy Spirit's role in this. Mary, yes, she had fearless obedience, and she's someone we should look at as a model for that, a motivation for that. But because many of us, we don't understand much of the Holy Spirit, and maybe we've never had what we might call an experience of, of the Holy Spirit, uh, we, we might even be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Or we, as I said, we marginalize Him, and I, I think I was guilty of doing that. And what I sensed was the Lord will speak to, to you and to me as I hear Him speak through me. I wanted to speak to us about the Holy Spirit. The title I gave this message is the answer to absolutely, positively, everything. And I thought, that, that would be too bad of a party message. I mean, I hope I can see you guys again, but in terms of these few weeks I'm here, uh, that, that, that's a pretty good order to fill. But I'm grateful I don't have to fill that order. God has to. And God says he's up for it. He can handle that. Because he is the answer to absolutely, positively, everything. Every question, every need, every struggle, every success. Some people, their downfall is from their success, not from their failures. Every question, every struggle, every success, every failure, every bad relationship, every physical ailment. He is absolutely, positively the answer to every one of those and anything, everything else that comes our way. Amen. So I, I want to leave you with this little template. And uh, how about you repeat after me? The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Spirit lives, lives in, me. in me. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Spirit walks, walks with me. With me. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit works, works through me. Through me. I'm not sure if you'll be able to keep that template in your mind, but I encourage you to think of just those three prepositions. In, with, through. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The Holy Spirit walks with you. The Holy Spirit works through you. I think I used this verse last Sunday to help kind of summarize the role of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4, 6. Not by might, not by power. What he's really saying is not by your might, not by their power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Listen to this commentary. Commentary says this. This verse was addressed to Zerubbabel. What a great name, huh? Some of us have interesting last names like Miliorati. Zerubbabel, I think, trumps them all. I love it. This is addressed to Zerubbabel, the governor, who along with Joshua, the high priest, had been charged by the prophet Haggai with the task of rebuilding the temple. This church has a task of building, rebuilding something. What is that? What is the task that your life has? See, see those of us who see God as a butler waiting to help us when we get a flat tire, whether that's literally a flat tire or just metaphorically, well, God's eager to help us, but but if all we see is that, that God is just there to kind of get us back on the road if we fall in the ditch, uh, we're missing the grand part of what it means to be a child of God. So this was addressed to governor, person in the political, civic sphere, high priest, prophet, so no matter if you see yourself as church connected or civic connected, uh, whatever it is that God has called you to do, He's called you to rebuild something. Rebuild the temple. Uh, Jesus said, I will build my church. Now I'm paraphrasing. The gates of hell will not prevail against it, but you're going to help me with it. I added that, but you're going to help me with it because He says it elsewhere. God's word to him is a reminder that the obstacles that face him in the rebuilding task will not be overcome by conventional resources of might or power. Instead, the resources will come from the outpouring of God's Spirit. 
Could we paraphrase what this commentator says this way? God's word to us individually and corporately, First Baptist Church, with their part of it. God's word to us is a reminder that the obstacles that face us in our daily lives and the obstacles that face us in advancing the kingdom of God through the ministry and service and love and evangelism of this church will not be overcome by conventional, traditional, we've done it before that way, let's just keep doing that until who knows what, conventional resources of might and power that basically are our programs and our ideas and our abilities. No, the, the resources will come. The, the, the breakthroughs will come. The direction for your life will come. The, the path for this church in and then after transition will come from an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We just sang the wonderful, all the lyrics were just wonderful today, speaking of the Holy Spirit. But as I sang that refrain over and over again in this, this last song, Holy Spirit rain down. Over the years I've, I've begun to see the word R-A-I-N, but my heart sings Holy Spirit R-E-I-G-N. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain in me, live in me. And when a church does that, all heaven breaks loose. And when I say that, there's some people, because we've been around the block in the church, we understand. We know that some churches, when all heaven breaks loose, it gets very uncomfortable and sometimes it feels embarrassing. And the problem with that is, well, they have to deal with that before the Lord. The problem with us with that is sometimes we then go so far in the other direction that the Holy Spirit has no place in our life. Always has a place in our theology. But having a place in our theology, but not our life, our experience, our, our praying, our doing, our sharing, our fellowshipping, our worshiping, means that we are we're living on breadcrumbs. Holy Spirit, rain down. The Holy Spirit lives in you. What does that mean? I talked just very briefly about the fact that the Holy Spirit is not a junior partner in the Trinity. We believe in one God, the uncreated creator. That if he started with a bang, yes, it was big. But how he did it, and how long ago he did it, we can discuss those things and science and all that. The bottom line is this, that in the beginning, whenever that beginning was, God pre-existed that beginning. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, he was not doing what had been done to him. We don't worship a created God. We worship a God that existed before all that we know as existence didn't exist. That God is one, the one true God. And yet, as we read the Bible, we see that God has revealed himself, and that the male pronoun does not mean that God is a male. God is not neither male nor female. But he reveals himself as Father, Son, Spirit. We understand Father. Again, it's not, he's not meant to say he's male, but the... the, the, the originator from whom all things come, Paul says in Ephesians. So he's the creator, the giver of life. We understand maybe even more about the Son because the eternal Son became the incarnate Son. We saying the word incarnate, which incarnate simply means flesh. God came in flesh. That's part of the scandal of the story. That's why some people can't handle Christmas. They think it's just about a little baby, but, but if they understood that it's about a little baby that somehow is fully human and yet fully God, uh, for some people that draws them in faith. For others, it, it, it makes they can't believe that a, a, the God, that the one God, would come in the form of well, in our form, would become one of us in order to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. Many people have died. But his death was the singular death that defeated 
sin. No one else that I know of has claimed that. And even if they did, they don't have the credentials. Perfect life, sinless, the lamb sacrifice, so to speak, in the Old Testament. But also, he, he wasn't just, he was one of us, but he was also fully God. And that's why sometimes people get confused when we talk about him being the son of God. It doesn't mean that he was a, a baby of God. God didn't have intercourse with a female God and they, he had this boy child. Son doesn't mean baby in this case. Son is like us saying George Washington is the father of our country. He's not in my lineage, but it, it's a term describing a role. Father, son. We understand this. So we read the Gospels. We're, we're, we go to Sunday school to try to be like Jesus. And we understand, we can never understand fully, but we understand maybe more about Father and Son than we do about Spirit. And the Spirit is, Jesus said, is like the wind. Well, I don't know about you, but I can't, I can't show you any wind. Uh, Jerry Taft or those weather guys can show you those bars on the, the <coughs> screen, but it's still not the wind. It's a representative of the wind. And yet the Holy Spirit is so essential to us. When you chose to receive Christ, or maybe today is your day to receive Christ, when that event took place, it wasn't like uh, the Father had an, an angel who then uh, sent you a text and said, okay, you're now in. You know, but the Father sent the Spirit, equally God, but the Father sent the Spirit to deliver eternal life to you. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says, The Holy Spirit is the one by whom you were sealed. Your redemption, your becoming part of God's family, transferring from darkness to light, from death to life, because of what Christ did for you, His good work, not your good works, that transaction is now sealed. It's authenticated. Back in those days, before they had Xerox machines that could falsify uh, a document, they had other ways of falsifying. But if you saw the seal of the king on that letter or uh, scroll, whatever it was, it meant this authenticates that what's inside, what you will read, is true. The Holy Spirit has put a seal on us authenticate that the salvation that only Christ could earn for us is true. But some of us think he kind of like the UPS guy, rings the doorbell, delivers it, and says, welcome to the family. Good luck. We'll see you in heaven, we hope. The Holy Spirit says, uh, unlike the UPS person, I'd love to come in and show you how to open this package, to begin to see the unfathomable riches that, that you now have access to. Uh, when you read the instruction manual, if you will, and it, I'll help you make sense. I, I, I don't need to sit in the corner and wait till you're confused. I want to sit with you right now. I live in you. I'm taking residence in you. You say, okay, Phil, we get it. Uh, we know what you're saying. The Holy Spirit lives in, in me. Then I would simply ask you, where is he? If, you're, if your life is a house, where is he? Does he have access to every room, every closet, every hidden place, every joyous place? Or is he asked to maybe be in a guest room and uh, we'll, we'll knock on the door when we're in trouble and need you for a little bit? The Holy Spirit lives in you for fellowship, to help you with your discipleship, to know how to become more like Christ. To help you worship. To the very things that we know we're supposed to do that frankly, in the flesh, on our own, even in a wonderful church family like we have here, they're difficult. And some of us have given up years ago. We just don't do it. We don't plan to grow any more in our discipleship. We, you know, we'll sing some songs with, you know, this worship thing. Thank you. But I mean, the Holy Spirit is not there, meant to be there in a reactive sense. Hang around until we have a problem. He's meant to be there in a proactive sense. He's the coach. He's the one that blows the whistle in the morning before your alarm goes off. It says, let's talk. Let's figure out the day. Let me show you some good words to encourage you. 
Let me prepare you because I know what's coming when you and the boss meet today. Let me prepare you for this. Let me talk to you about that. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And he's glad. He's not trapped. He doesn't look up and say, why did, you know, Father, why, are, you, are you punishing me that I have to hang around with this guy, Phil? Well, sometimes he might say that about me. But, but he's not in prison. He's there voluntarily. Holy Spirit lives in you. I still have a few minutes. I'm going to pray. I don't think I'm done yet. Let's pray. Lord, here's my prayer. That you would give each one of us here one of these two prayers. That prayer that simply says, Holy Spirit, I'm glad that you've been in my life. I, I know I've received Christ. I know you've been here. You've helped me so many times. I love you. Help me to follow you. From the first minute I get up, through every room of my house, when I'm at school, or work, or play, or in trouble, Holy Spirit, rain down on me. Or maybe your prayer is something like this. God, I'm not sure about all this stuff. I don't, I don't know all this stuff, but I, I'm sure about this, that I need you. I need what I can only get through the Holy Spirit who brings Jesus into my life, the gift of eternal life, salvation by grace through faith, not of my works. I have nothing, so that there's nothing I can do to earn it or brag about it. I know I need that. I'm not even sure all of what I'm going to receive or all I'm asking for. I'm simply saying this, Holy Spirit, come, bring the faith that I need to have in Christ. And then please show me today, tomorrow, every day of my life, how to follow Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. The Holy Spirit lives in you. The Holy Spirit walks with you. I was doing a sermon many years back, but I don't remember what it was, but I, did, I remember this happening. I was going to be in, in John uh, 14, verse 26. And if you have a Bible, you may want to turn there to just see it. But in John 14, 26. I'm sorry. It said 26, here it says 16. I think it's 16. It says, uh, and I will ask the Father, this is Jesus speaking, I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter that he remain with you forever. The Holy Spirit walks with me. Jesus is saying, uh, guys, he's talking to his, his disciples. Uh, we've had a great time, uh, but I'm about to, you don't know what's coming. I'm about to go to the cross. I'm about to die for your sins. I'm going to raise again. I'm going I'm to uh, defeat death. I'm going to rise again. I'm going to spend some time with you, but I'm going to ascend. I'm going to go back to heaven. Not because I'm tired, not because, uh, you know, that was, uh, my job's done. My job continues, but it continues up there where I go face to face with the Father. Father and Son, continuing to love you. I'm going to pray, we're going to talk, and I'm going to want to help you from heaven. But I don't want to leave you alone. So I will send my spirit. You will have as much of God in you, because the Holy Spirit is God, fully God. You will have as much of God in you as those who are in heaven have. It will just be different. Of course, when you're in His presence, it's different. But it's not like you have just a tiny bit. You have all that you need. I will send Him to you, so that the Father that you worship receives your worship. So that as I pray, talk with the Father, your life will have the power through the Holy Spirit to fulfill the destiny that he has for you. Somebody say, well, you know, I, that's good for the younger people. I, you know, I, I'm on the senior end. Every day there's a destiny. We never retire from needing the work of the Holy Spirit to help us fulfill the calling we have. And the calling we have may be very, not only very simple, and maybe we don't even realize we're doing it. My wife Kara was at a meeting just yesterday at church banquet and uh, met, some, met someone who had, uh, she had worked with when she was a director of a Christian preschool many years ago. Long story short, that woman said to her, you don't even realize the kinds of things that I saw you do as I was watching you that have stayed with me till this day. I love bragging on my wife. But the point is, you're really bragging on the Holy Spirit, who even if she didn't know it, or how she talked in a board meeting, how she got down on her knees and dealt with a child, how she interacted with a parent that might have been angry. I don't know what they were, but something stuck in that woman's life. Every 
every day is an opportunity to fulfill our destiny. Destinies aren't just for people who make you know, mega millions because they can play a, a sport game or sing well or something. The real destiny of the world, and, the, and Jesus said, I will build my church. Yeah, there's some great superstars, but we've made them superstars. The real superstars of the faith are people like you and me that no one will ever write articles about, and yet we are faithful in allowing the Holy Spirit to be with us. That word comforter sticks out in that verse. And I began to do my study, preparing for my sermon, and I realized that not every version of the scriptures, not every translation of the scriptures use the word comforter. I don't have time to really go through this, but let me give you a sense of how many different words are used to explain that one Greek word in that, in that, uh, in that description. First of all, the word comfort. The English etymology is a combination, combination of intense force, the word com, or the prefix com, intense force, and strong fort, fortress. To comfort is much more than cheering up somebody when they are sad. To comfort is to fortify to literally build a fort around the person. You see, the Holy Spirit comes into your life, not just to, forgive me for the caricature, but some of the folks that we, in streams and denominations and expressions of, of the Holy Spirit that we've seen, uh, they bother us because it seems, I'll speak for myself, it, it sometimes seems trivial, it seems like manipulative, it seems like you're just trying to get a buzz for the day. I'll stay away from you. I don't think I can recreate that illustration. It's much more than cheering us up. It's much more than this, oh, please don't give up. God will be so dis discouraged. Keep going. It's to literally build a fort around you and to build a fort around this church. You don't have to fear anything that God has for you. And remember Peter? She came down. God said, me. Peter said, no, God. Oh, what do you, who do you think you are, God? I mean, uh, anything that God tells you guys to do in your life as a Christian, in the future for this church, don't be afraid of it. If God's saying it, don't vote on it. Discern it. And if it's God, listen to the two spies that heard God, not the ten that didn't. If you've heard that old story in the scriptures. It's a comfort. But another translation, synonym of that is the word counselor. He's there to build that fort around you. And one of the ways that fort is made strong is as he teaches you the word of God. He gives you the counsel, the wisdom, the truth of scripture. He's an encourager. You say, well, yeah, that's like a cheerleader. Well, kind of. But what is, what, what is the word encouragement? It's the word courage and the prefix in. He puts courage into people. What is it that God wants you to do? You might know that. You might say, but I don't have the faith to do it, or I don't have something to do it. He'll put the courage in you to do it. If this church is going to really discern the will of God for its future, you're going to need courage. I know one thing he's not going to ask you to do. He's not going to ask you to just, eh, just keep showing up every Sunday and sing a few songs and, you know, put a few dollars in the offering plate. Just don't, don't, don't bother me. It'll be nice, you know. Children are made to be seen and not heard. It's a terrible statement, but that's, God's not saying that to this church. He's saying, "I will build my. I am building my church, and the gates of hell are trying to kill it." Are you with me? Yeah. You need courage. The Holy Spirit walks with us to in to courage in us. Helper is another word, just a very practical thing. You know, the Holy Spirit can help you. All you have to do is ask. How do I get through this mess? Help. The Holy Spirit is an advocate. Advocate is somebody who stands, I often see that the, you know, uh, it's like Perry Mason stand, I'm sorry, it's an old show, you know, there's many more there. But, you know, the lawyer standing up next to the, the person who's accused. 
and speaking to the judge on behalf. That's what the Holy Spirit will do, will advocate for you. Intercessor will make sure that your prayers are not just your list, but come out of God's love. Stand by, strengthener, friend. We could spend a week on each of these terms, and obviously you don't have the time. Here's the point I'm making. The Holy Spirit who lives in you is the Holy Spirit who is ready to walk with you into any circumstance, into every situation, and he is totally adequate to be who you need him to be in that decision, in that difficulty, in that disappointment. He is everything you and I can't be. So don't think of him as way up there. God, I, I, gotta, I hope my prayer gets past the ceiling. You know, maybe I'll text it. I hope that there's no interference in the, you know, in the asteroid belt that somehow will get to you. You don't have to send that prayer anywhere. Holy Spirit, help me pray about this. Some of you are excellent prayers. When you get up to pray or when it's your turn or when you start praying, uh, people are blessed. Hallelujah. A lot of us have struggled to pray. But you know what? None of our prayers compare to the prayer that we would, any of us would pray by the Holy Spirit. Oh, it doesn't mean that we suddenly become a great orator. It, it simply means that we'll be praying the heart of God, the mind of Christ, but only when we do it by the power of the Spirit. Holy Spirit lives in you. The Holy Spirit walks with you. And if you will change him from being in a reactive mode to giving him permission to be in proactive mode, to be your coach, your life is going to change. But the Holy, here's where it changes it. The Holy Spirit works through you, works through us together. And that's what the adventure is about. The Holy Spirit brings salvation in Christ, not by our works, but by what Christ has done. The Holy Spirit remains and walks with us in every circumstance, every situation. He has the wisdom, the knowledge, the power to help us through whatever it is we need to get through so that the Holy Spirit can begin to work through us. And say, well, that's nice, but you know, I, not much I can do. See, that kind of attitude is really, uh, it, it's rude. It's saying the Holy Spirit can't gift me. All these, I, you know, I can't do what this guy does, preaching to 20,000. He's not asking to do that. I can't sing like that person does, and they sell all these CDs, and people like that. He's not asking you to do that. He's asking you to be you. And maybe for some of us, the, 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 the unhappiness in our service or the, the sense that we have not accomplished much is not because we've been, I'll speak for myself, it's not because I have been me, it's because I have, I've only been me. But when I am me with he, when I am me, empowered by the Spirit, the Spirit working through me, oh, well, Jesus said, my followers will do greater things than I've done. That's why understanding the gifts of the Spirit are so important. So, yeah, there's some great gifted people. Well, you're a person who's gifted. If the Holy Spirit, you said, no, I don't have, if you don't have gifts of the Spirit, then you don't have the Spirit. And if you don't have the Spirit, you don't have salvation. So what is it? Are you saved? Are you in Christ? Yeah. Or are you still trying to earn your salvation? No, 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 I, I believe in Christ. Okay, well then, the Holy Spirit has brought that salvation to you, and the Holy Spirit always distributes gifts of service to his people. Amen. It may run through your talent, it may run through your passion, it may run through your experience, but everyone has something to contribute to the work of the Capital C Church. Amen. Sometimes it's inside the building, the discipleship, the building up of the saints. Sometimes it's outside the building, taking the love and the faith and the hope of God into places where church can't get, but Christ can and people's eyes open, and they begin to find and follow Christ because of you. And Peter sums it up really simple, really quickly. 
There's several passages that talk about all the gifts, and I encourage you to read in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. In 1 Peter 4, 10, it says this, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Each of you. Did you hear that? God has given each of you. Use them well to serve one another. Peter asks two questions. Do you have gifts of speaking? Are you a communicator? And speak as though God himself was speaking through you. Maybe that's teaching, maybe that's leadership, different kinds of gifts. Maybe you have the gift of helping or serving others. It says do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. That everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. But some of us, sadly, Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Spirit. Some of us grieve the Spirit. Other translations say, don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Don't give God's Spirit any reason to be upset with you. Beware of grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Saying that you don't have a gift grieves the Holy Spirit of God. It's as if you're saying, He's a liar. He said that He gives to each one, but not me. Nothing I can do. The Holy Spirit lives in you. That's a sign that you're saved that you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit walks with you. That's a sign that you're safe and secure. That fortress is built up. But see, some people in some churches use that fortress mentality to try to keep the world out, which we don't want worldliness in our lives and in the church. But the problem is we still have to get out in the world. We have to get not just our own lives to live out in the world, we have to get the good news out. Amen. And for some of us, this fortress mentality, this holy huddle, we are saddest, so blessed by what we have together that we just shut the rest of the world out. Lani Moon Offering is a great way for us to partner with around the world. But putting a check, putting some money, as generous as you are, in the offering plate does not satisfy what he's calling us to do here. The Holy Spirit works through you. I hope you spend these next few days asking him how. Ask him to maybe show you how you've done it in the past and let it refresh and do it again. Maybe it's time for a whole new approach for you, for this church. I don't know. But it doesn't matter what I would think. And you know what? It doesn't matter what you would think. What matters is what does God think? What's God up to? See, that's the adventure that you're going on as this transition comes into place. That's the adventure. All we want to know is what God wants. What has God been, what has God affirmed as to the gifts and abilities He's given us and this, the things that have happened in our past? Uh, who are we today so that we know how God wants us to move in the future? How do you find that out? Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it from Scripture. Ask the Holy Spirit to put a passion, a direction, a kind of prayer in your, in your heart that you hear yourself praying that you've never prayed before. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment when you hear the opinions and ideas of others in the church or reading a magazine, whatever it might be. But bottom line is it doesn't matter what I would come and say, this is what you guys ought to do. That, that would, I would hopefully only give you good ideas. You know what? It doesn't matter what you think you ought to do. You've got plenty of good ideas. We just need one God idea. That's where we see churches doing amazing things because they have discerned a God idea and they won't let go of it. Amen. So, I'll pray in a moment, but I'll go back just briefly to the message of Peter. Great man, fearless obedience, but even he said no to God when God was saying yes. Peter, do this. Here, here's, here's your next. Peter, the day, day of Pentecost was great, wasn't it, Peter? Oh, yeah, Lord, that wasn't that long ago, but yeah, wow, that was great. Boy, some things happened, Peter. I've been reading that book that Luke's writing, the Acts of the Apostles. Some great things. What, what, a, what a book you're going to be able to write. Oh, Lord, wow, you've just done some great things. Wow, what a ride it's been. Good. Peter, here's the next chapter. Go and eat. Do something you've not done before. Do something that breaks the rules. Not the truth, but the rules. Oh, no, Lord, no. 
Even if you tell them no, don't do that. You may be more comfortable, but don't do that. Say yes to God even before you know what he wants you to do. That takes courage. And the Holy Spirit knows how to give it to you. Jesus, what are you saying today? I ask Holy Spirit that you are bothering me, bothering my sisters, bothering my brothers. In areas where we need to be bothered because of sin, please, please, please. But Lord, there are other areas, areas of, of things we've done well, or using our gifts, or whatever it might be, bother us in those areas so that you get our attention. So that, Holy Spirit, you can give us the discernment to know what it is you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true God, have planned for us, for our lives, for this church, for the future. There's nothing else that we want. I pray that that's true, Lord. And I pray that right now there are people saying, Jesus, come into my life. Start my life, day one, right now, as a follower of yours, as a believer in you. No matter how much I know about you or don't know about you, I want to learn. I want to love. I want to know that I'm one of yours. Bring that Holy Spirit to put that seal that says, authentic son, authentic daughter, of the King of the Universe. Amen. Amen.